All right, this morning, the title of the message is Advocating. Advocating, and it's, it's for our advocate, and our advocate is Jesus Christ. And, you know, if any of you are like me, there are times in your lives where you need an advocate. You need somebody to step in on your behalf. I can't tell you how many times I've needed somebody to step in on my behalf. And fortunately, he's there. He's there. And man, how awesome is that? Let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for giving us Jesus, who stands at your right hand, advocating on our behalf. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us so much that you do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you, God. We love you, Lord. Amen. So, have you ever needed an advocate? Think about in your own lives, throughout your life. Mine, whenever I started thinking about this, there were a lot of different stories that kept coming up, you know, memories that kept coming up of when I needed an advocate. Paul, I'm not going to tell your story. You needed an advocate every now and then. <laughs> uh, I was like, all right, I can connect with this guy. <laughs> we both, <laughs> we've made some of those choices. But um, the one time that really stood out to me, uh, it was one of my earlier memories of, of school. And I was in first or second grade. I texted my mom and asked her which one. She never texted me back. Thanks a lot, Mom. But it, it, it's not too much, uh, too much of a difference on the story. But when I was in first or second grade, I was in lunch, and I started praying over my food because that's what we do. You know, that's how I was raised. And the principal, I won't mention her name, um, she came up to me and put her hand on my shoulder and said, Son, you can't do that here. And I said, what? She said, you can't, you can't pray here in school. And I said, is that right? <laughs> even, even as a little kid, like I, my, my faith was extremely important to me. And what my parents taught me was extremely important to me. And she said, no, you can't. And... Long story short, I ended up in the principal's office, <laughs> and, and uh, they called my mom and dad, and next thing I know, my dad comes rolling in the school, and my dad, um, he really didn't get involved a whole lot in things, so to see him come in, it really surprised me. I kind of expected to see my mom there. But dad comes rolling in, and I remember, like, there's this little, there's a doorway, the hallway out there, doorway, small little hallway into the principal's office. And there's chairs, like, right outside the principal's office. I'm sitting there, and he comes rolling in. I'm like, hey, dad. He didn't look at me, didn't say anything. Boom, straight into the principal's office, slammed the door behind him, and it just <laughs> blew up in there. Um, and then shortly after, I mean, I'm sitting there like, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, shortly after he comes out, picks me up, walks me straight to my brother's class, who was in like third or fourth grade, swings the door open, Toby, get your stuff. And Toby's like, mm, grabs his stuff, comes over. We walked out the door, and I didn't go back to school that year. Um, I did homeschool. They didn't, they didn't tell me I got the rest of the year off. But... Uh, but we homeschooled the rest of that year, and my parents went to school board meetings and all that stuff, and that principal didn't show up the next year. Um, so I got to go back to school. But uh, my parents were my advocate at that point. You know? They were standing up for me because I was standing up for what was right, and they weren't going to put up with that. And that was, a, that was an, interesting, an interesting experience as a, as a small kid. 
but it, I think that it really rooted something deep down inside me to always try to stand up for what was right, for what I believe, to do what I believe no matter what, no matter who you're standing against. If you're doing what's right, it's the right thing, you know? And sometimes it takes coming in and standing firm on your stance and doing whatever it has to take, even if that's confronting evil face to face. Now, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm excited about this message. I'm going to try to like somewhat stand still, but putting this message together um, has been a blast. So, 1 John 2.1. 1 John 2.1 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So that you may not sin. I'm telling you this so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He doesn't want us to sin, obviously, but we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. He says, but if you do sin, you have an advocate who's with the Father. He's literally with the Father, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the righteous one. The righteous one. So, advocate. You guys know that I like to define things, right? So, the word that jumps out is advocate on this one. And advocate stands for, and I want you to think about this. This is the word that was chosen to describe who Jesus is and what he's doing for you right now. For you and for me. He's our champion, our upholder, our supporter. He supports us. He's our backer, our promoter, our protector. Our protector. That's our advocate. He's our protector. Fighter for. He fights for us. He's a professional pleader or a legal practitioner or attorney. This is the term that's used describing Jesus Christ and what he's doing for you. This is what he does for us right now. The verbs for it is recommended or commended, advise, favor, he favors us, approve of, he approves of us, back or support, uphold, champion for. Campaign on our behalf. He campaigns on our behalf. Stands up for, speaks for, argues for, pleads for, lobbies for, urges, promotes, endorses, and vouches for. He vouches for us. This is what he's doing on our behalf. Like Paul said, I don't want you to sin, but if you do, this is what God is doing. This is what God the Father is hearing. He's hearing his son, Jesus, who went to the cross for you, who died on the cross for you, who gave up his life. He was tortured and tormented on your behalf. And this, these are the things that he's doing for you in heaven. Is that not mind-blowing? But we want to take it on to ourselves, right? We have to be perfect. We have to be the righteous one. We have to be so holy and spotless and blameless before we even come to him. We think that we have to get it all right. But when you sin, Jesus stands there in the gap. And he is your defender. He's the one that's championing for you, fighting for you, urging and arguing for you, petitioning the Father on your behalf. Why would we even need an advocate? Why would we need an advocate? We need an advocate because of sin, guys. Like it said, we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. The best things that we can do, the most holy and righteous things that we can do as human beings are as filthy rags. We all need a Savior. We all need an advocate. And he freely gave it to us. He accepted that position. 
and he took it on himself. We need an advocate because we have an adversary that also goes to the Father and tries to condemn you and tries to blame you and tries to point out all the bad things that we've ever done in our whole lives. And you're like, seriously? Like Satan gets up and, and goes and talks to God? He can't do that. He was cast out, right? Well, not according to what the Word says. <clears throat> if you want, you can turn to Revelations 12, 9 through 10. You don't have to because I'm going to be hitting verses here to drive the point home. If you want, you can come see me afterwards. I'll give you a list of them. Revelations 12, 9 through 10. The last book of the Bible, John, on the Isle of Patmos, is being told by Jesus what to write down. And he says, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. He's the deceiver of the whole world. He's deceptive. He's constantly trying to twist the truth, bend the truth against us. That's what he does. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Y'all know I mention that a lot because I think it's super cool because he was cast out like lightning. It's just such an amazing picture. It says, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. The authority of his Christ has come. Christ has that authority. The authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Did you catch that last part? He accuses us day and night before the Father. So here he is, the evil one, the deceiver, Satan. He's standing before God and trying to accuse us day and night because he doesn't want us in that relationship with God. But I've got great news. God does want us in that relationship with him. No matter how much this guy stands there and tries to condemn us and tries to accuse us. In Job 2.2, 2, <clears throat> it says, And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord, God the Father is talking to Satan. And he says, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord. If he says, from where do you come? Clearly he was somewhere, and now he's there in front of the Lord. And he says, Satan answers him and says to the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Satan Himself, the devil, the accuser, is walking on the earth, going to and fro, walking about, right? 1 Peter 5, 8 says, it warns us, it says, So be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like, not is, but like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Have you seen on, like, the National Geographic or something, you've seen lions hunting? It's the women. Thank you, ladies. They go out and they kill the prey. They drag it back to the lions and they all devour it. Have you seen lions devouring their prey? That's the descriptive word that's used here. That's a pretty descriptive term. That's a heck of a way to talk about what Satan is trying to do to us. He's trying to rip us apart, shred us apart, devour us, consume us, so that we can't do anything. It takes our lives from us. That's what Satan was trying to do. That's what he tells God, the Father. This is what I'm doing. I'm rolling around your earth trying to devour your people. This is what Jesus says in Luke twenty-two thirty-one. 31. Jesus' words... In Luke twenty-two thirty-one, 31, he says, Simon, Simon, 
Behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Satan demanded to have you so that you might be sifted like wheat. Jesus didn't go on to say, but don't worry. He didn't get it. He's reminding Simon, you better keep yourself in check. Keep your eyes fixed on me. Stay in relationship and community with me because Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. You remember what happened to Simon, Peter. He denied Jesus three times and it absolutely crushed him. It destroyed his, his, um, his soul, his inner being, you know. It just absolutely devastated him. But fortunately, we have a Savior that came back and drew him back into himself and healed him and restored him and brought him back. And he says, you're the rock that I'm going to build my church on. Even though Satan demanded to take him and sift him like wheat, he did. He shook his life up. Have you ever had your life shaken up? I've had my life shaken up big time. Big time. You know, if I think about all those things, I'm like, guys, you might not want me as an elder. <laughs> you know? Fortunately, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And now I have the word of my testimony. He's restored me, renewed me, set me free from those things. Thank you, Jesus. And that's what he will do with you. In Ephesians 4.27, it says, And give no opportunity to the devil. Give no opportunity to the devil. That means you can give opportunity to the devil. You can give him a right to demand to sift you like wheat. You can. I promise you don't want to, but you can you can. So, like I asked, why would we need an advocate? You need an advocate because Satan clearly is roaming around trying to find who he can go and then accuse before the Father. That's why we need an advocate. There are, this is going on consistently. It says day and night he stands before God trying to accuse you day and night. Guys, if you think that we're not in a battle every single day, especially on Sunday mornings whenever we get up and get ready to go to church and hear the Word of God, is that not when He tries to attack us the most? Of course. Any time that you're going to go and you're going to spend time where your relationship is going to get built and strengthened and deepened, your love and your, your knowledge and understanding and relationship of the Father God and Jesus and what He's done for you and the Holy Spirit and how He helps you, of course He's going to come against you. Of course He's going to try to say, God, do you know that they did this? I'm just saying, did you know that Nathan was doing this? But guess what? As soon as he opens his stinking mouth, our advocate steps in. Our advocate steps in. Mine, yours, the one that loves you, the one that died for you, he stands up. Oh, oh, he stands up. And it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, we don't want to confess our sins. Confessing our sins is not fun. It stinks. It really stinks. It's not fun. It hurts. It, we think that it's going to be more painful than it is, but honestly, it flips that light on. And it, it completely overcomes his ability to accuse you because you say, you know what? Yes, I was wrong. I did this. I'm sorry. I want to move past that. I want, to, I want to be healed. I want to be restored and redeemed and set free. And I did that. And I need to get it out. And you get it out, and it totally removes the power from the enemy. He now can't hold you under his thumb. He's so proud of you whenever you do that. Because it gives him the opportunity to redeem you. 
to restore you and say, see, see, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's my brother, that's my friend. And what I did for them is more than enough. It says, if we do this, he is faithful and he is just. He's faithful. You can trust him. You can know he is going to do it. And he's just. He's just. It doesn't mean that nobody has to pay for what you did. It means that somebody did pay for what you did. And his name is Jesus Christ. He paid for those sins so that he could stand up and get in Satan's face and say, not today. Not today. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood. Redemption through his blood. That means that we've been redeemed because of what he did. Yes, blood had to be shed. A sacrifice had to be made, and it was made. It's been done. We have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our, our trespasses according to the, rich, according to the riches of his grace. The forgiveness of our trespasses, our sins, our wrongs, the things that he's trying to take to the Father and say, look at this. The forgiveness of those things. We have that forgiveness according to the riches of his grace. His grace is so rich. It's so deep. It's so great. Whenever we've sinned, don't we want somebody to have grace on us? We want it. Sometimes it's hard to give. I want to encourage you, give grace, give mercy, because it's been given to you. You want more of it? Give more of it. You don't think somebody's earned it? They haven't. Neither have you. Neither have I. A friend of mine that I work with, super awesome dude, love him to death. I took something for his two kids to work one day, because God put it on my heart to, to give these things to him. And uh, I said, here, man, these are for your daughters. And he goes, oh, I don't know that they deserve that. And I said, they don't. And neither do you and neither do I. We don't deserve any good gift of our own. But because Jesus and what he's done for us, they do deserve it. And you do deserve it. Because he paid the price for you to have it. You can't keep beating yourself up. You can't. He paid the price so that you can have it. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore, he is able once and forever, once and forever to save those who come to God through him. This is awesome. This is awesome. I like I highlighted it and I put a big star next to it because this is my favorite part. Therefore, he is able once and forever, forever, let that sink in, forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. He lives forever to intercede with God on our behalf. It doesn't say he went to God once and it was done. He intercedes for us constantly. So whenever we sin and we feel bad and we're like, man, I totally blew it. I can't go to Jesus now. I can't go pray now. I can't come to the Father now. Look at what I've done. I did it again. I did it again. And, and I told him I would never do it again. I tried to repent. I tried to turn and go the other way. But here I am, doing it again. I can't go back. It's like I nailed him back on the cross. No, it's not like you nailed him back on the cross because he paid for it once and forever. It's done. He paid for it. From the beginning to the end, it's done. It's finished. But he stands there interceding because Satan keeps trying to run his suck and put you in a bad light toward God. That's what he does. Oh, my goodness. It's ridiculous. I just want to slap that dude. That's right. Let's all do it. 
If it were up to me, man, whenever we got there, it'd be like, get in line, everybody. We all get our shot. <laughs> uh, that's why I'm not God, I guess. He lives forever to intercede with God on, on our behalf because Satan is demanding to sift us. Satan demands to sift us. And he intercedes forever. He lives forever to do this on our behalf. So what does intercede mean? This is pretty stinking awesome. Think about this. Think about this. And it's a little bit different. But it's a different term. And it has a little bit different meaning. But it's also exactly what Jesus is doing for us. This is what he does for us. He intervenes on behalf of another. That's what intercede means. Intervenes on behalf of another. He mediates. He acts as an intermediary. He negotiates. Acts as an honest broker. He steps in for us. He becomes or gets involved. He becomes or gets involved. That's what he did. He took on our sin and our shame. He got involved. He acted on our behalf. Take action. Take a hand. Jesus is taking our hand, helping us. The word says that he lifts us up and holds us up by his mighty right hand. Isn't that amazing? He sits at the right hand of God, and then he holds us up with his mighty right hand. Whenever Satan's trying to kick you down and stomp you, he's holding you up. He's helping you. To intercede means to plead or petition. He petitions the Father on our behalf. He steps in on our behalf. It reminds me of whenever I was younger, a kid. I grew up with an older brother, two and a half years older than me. Awesome, love the dude to death. But whenever you're a kid, you get to pick on your brothers and sisters. They, nobody else does, right? <laughs> right? Am I right? My brother, believe it or not, even though I was the perfect kid, people wanted to fight me every now and then. It wasn't that I ran my mouth a lot um, or that I knew that I had a big brother that also believed like me and wouldn't let somebody pick on me. Um, but people, that's, that's totally a lie. I ran my mouth a lot. And I deserved some stuff. Well, fortunately, I had a big brother that thought, you know what? Even if my little brother's running his mouth, you don't get to do anything about it. Um, and my brother was a very good fighter. Very, very good. Um, probably still is. But... He would step in on my behalf sometimes, even if I didn't want him to. Even if I already took care of the problem, he would still come and take care of the problem. I mean, I remember being a freshman, and this senior wanted to go to the front of the line at lunch, and I'm like, no, sir, not today. And because he did it all the time. He thought he was cool because he was a pitcher on the baseball team, whatever. I'm like, no, 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 no. Not today. He's like, move your leg, Briggs. I'm like, mm -mm. go to the back of the line like everybody else. He's like, move it or I'm going to move it. I said, move it. So he tried to move it, and it didn't go well for him. Well, my brother found out. And my brother was a year younger than this guy. And he comes to school. He was, he was asked to not come to school for something that he had done. Um. <laughs> But he comes to school anyway because he found out somebody had the audacity to mess with his little brother. I'm like, bro, I took care of it. And no, he was, he was not going to stand for that. He was going to have justice his way. Well, he interceded on my behalf, right? Just like Jesus intercedes on our behalf. Maybe kind of just like that. I mean, he is going to, he is going to chain 
Satan, you know, and throw him into a fiery pit of hell. So, I mean, he does, eh, it's kind of like that. But just like my brother fought for me on multiple occasions, and I fought for him on multiple occasions, I'm not going to say I didn't, we have a brother named Jesus that fights for us. He's not going to stand for somebody coming and trying to pick on us and trying to lie about us and trying to run our name in the dirt. He's not going to put up with it. He intercedes on our behalf. Through my whole life, I've had a mom that's interceded on my behalf in prayer. It's probably one of the main reasons I'm still alive today. Now, I have my mom, but then I also have my wife that intercedes for me. I hear her pray for me. I've heard her pray for me. I know she prays for me every day. Which is, you know, like you said, she's, she's definitely, definitely my better half. That was, that was God strategically keeping me alive. You know, it was him saying, look, Briggs, you're going to need this. Okay? And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> he knows what we need. Before we even know what we need. Hebrews 9.15 says, Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant. He's the mediator of a new covenant. Hebrews 9.15. He's the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. He's our mediator so that we can receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. You know, the first covenant says that when we sin, something has to die. Something has to be sacrificed. It's got to be pure. It's got to be spotless. It's got to be righteous. It's got to be perfect but it has to die to cover your sins. Jesus is this mediator. He was perfect. He was without sin. He had to die. Blood had to be shed, and it was, but it's for us forever so that we can have this promised eternal inheritance. It's not on our own. It's not by our own actions. It's by his actions and what he's done for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake, for our sake, that's what the word says clearly, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, we might become the righteousness of God. Guys, we have to take that, we have to hold on to it, we have to cherish it, we have to let that sink into our hearts, into our minds, into everything that we are, because what he did made us the righteousness of God. If you say, I don't deserve to have God, I don't deserve to come to him, I don't deserve because of my actions, because of the things that I've done, I don't deserve it then you're saying what he did was not enough for you. His sacrifice was not enough. If you say, I still have to earn my righteousness, you're saying what Jesus did for you on the cross is enough for other people, but just not enough for you. I want you in your mind. I want you to picture him on that cross. I want you to picture him on that cross. And I want you to hear in your ears Jesus himself saying these words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I want you to understand what he was saying is for you. It's for me. It's for you. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's interceding already 
while he's in the process of being tortured to death. He's interceding because he knows you can't do it on your own. He came to the earth because he knew you couldn't do it on your own. Nothing you could do would be good enough. We were born into sin. And he has made us righteous. He has made us become the righteousness of God. So don't ever again say, I'm not good enough. I'm not holy. I'm not righteous. Because if you do, you're calling God a liar. You're calling God himself a liar. He has made a way where there is no way. He has made a way. So no longer are you not righteous. No longer are you not holy because he has made you holy. He has called you into a royal priesthood. All you have to do is accept that what he did for you truly is enough. You have to love him and believe him. There's an interesting story in the Old Testament. It's in Numbers 16. The whole story is number 16, 41 through 50. 41 through 50. I've alluded to it before. I've talked about it a little bit before. But this is such a phenomenal example. So some of the Levites, actually God's chosen people to be the priests, the royal priesthood, started to come against Moses and Aaron. And they started to think, well, what makes you so awesome? What makes you so great? And they're like, well, I mean, God chose us. I don't know, we do what he tells us to do. That's about it. You know, that's literally it. Well, they start coming against him. Well, God doesn't like that very much. And he decides to wipe those people out. And he does. The earth opens up, swallows these people. There are three main leaders of that thing. But then 250 other people that were following those three people. God tells Moses and Aaron, he says, get away from them. I'm going to take them out right now. And he does. He takes them out. But then the rest of the Israelites, the next day it says, they were really upset. They're like, God's going to kill us all. Let's go back. And they're, they're grumbling against Moses and Aaron, right? And God comes. He's in the cloud above the tabernacle, in front of the tabernacle. And Moses and Aaron, as soon as the cloud falls, Moses and Aaron know it's time to go meet with God. There he is, time to go meet with him. So they go. And God says, hey, guys, I hear what's going on. I hear what these people are saying. Get away from them because I'm going to wipe them out. I'm not putting up with this. And it says they fell face down. They humbled themselves. That is a position of humble, uh, of hum humility and respect and honor. They fall face down. And Moses, being the quick thinker that he is, he says, Aaron, grab your censer, which is the thing that they, you know, they shake, it smokes, has, has a good smelling aroma. He says, grab that thing and run out into the middle of the people because God's fury is falling on them right now. They were, they were down. They were face down. But he knew, we've got to stop this or we're not going to have anybody. <laughs> you know, Everybody's going to say, look what, look what God did to the Israelites. He brings them out of Egypt. Brings them out of Egypt just to wipe them out in the, in the wilderness. So Aaron being obedient, jumps up, grabs the censer, runs into the middle of the people that God has already started to kill with a plague. Like 14, 14 and a half thousand people were already dead. Aaron runs out and it says he stood between the dead and the living. You could see the hand of God moving across these people. Moses and Aaron interceded on behalf of the Israelites and God stopped. He stopped what he was doing. 
and the rest of them got to live. That is, a, that is a picture painted for us in Numbers 16 that shows intercession. It's like, a, it's like a, a type and shadow of Jesus interceding on our behalf. They deserve to die, yet someone interceded and God stopped killing them. The wages of sin is death, guys. Believe it or not, we deserve to die. We do. But because of what Jesus did, we don't have to. In Micah 7, 18 through 19. I love this, man. This is so cool. Micah 7, 18 through 19. Micah was a prophet in the Old Testament. A judge. It says, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. We are the remnant of his heritage, you and me. Pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. God delights in mercy. He finds joy in it. He loves it. He wants to be merciful. He delights in it. He will again have compassion on us. He will again have compassion on us. We've all been in the place where we've needed compassion for goodness sakes. And this is our hope. He will again have compassion on us. And he will subdue our iniquities. Subdue our iniquities? He will He's going to subdue our iniquities, our sins. What does subdue mean? Subdue means to overcome or bring under control. He's going to bring under control our sin, our iniquities. He's going to conquer it, defeat it, vanquish it, overpower it, crush it, gain the upper hand over, and triumph over our iniquities. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so awesome. And that's in Micah 7, 18 through 19. And then the very end of it is outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. The very end of that verse says, You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You'll cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. You know there's places in the sea and the ocean that no one has ever seen? There's a good chance no one ever will see it, even with our technology advancing as much as it is. The pressure, the darkness, the cold, all those things to the depths of the sea, we've seen a lot of things. You know, we even got to go all the way down to where the Titanic is and see that. But guys, that's a fraction of how deep the ocean actually is. A fraction of it. He says he's going to throw this into the depths of the sea. Another place says that he will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. I don't know if you've ever, you can never get there. Like if you try, you, it's like a cat chasing its tail. Only a cat sometimes catches its tail, and that's really funny. But if you try to go from the east to the west, you'll never get there. You will constantly be going west. And he tells us that because you, he's letting us know you'll never find it again. I'll never find it again. It's covered in the blood of Jesus. It's covered by the sacrifice that he made so that he can rightfully stand in that place at the right hand of God and say, no, no, I paid for that. I covered that. It is no more. And the Father doesn't even see it. Doesn't even see it. I want to ask you guys, have you accepted this for yourself? It's hard to accept for yourself. I'll tell you right now, it's super hard. I think that it's maybe one of those things that we constantly have to renew our minds daily about. Because constantly, Satan's not going to stop. He's not going to stop trying to lie in your ear. He wants to rip you as far away from God as he can because he hates you. He hates you because you look like him, because you are like him. 
You were created in his image and in his likeness, and he hates you. He wants you dead. He wants to devour you. But, but we have Jesus as our advocate. And he ain't going away, ever. Have you truly said thank you to him? Thank you to Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifices that you made. Have you truly said thank you for the fact that he stands in the gap? He's made you righteous and holy. It's only because of him that you will get to have eternal life. If you haven't said thank you and you haven't received this for yourself, please do so and do it immediately. Don't let another second pass. And if you know anybody that hasn't, I encourage you to encourage them to do it. Tell them who he is. Tell them the life that they get to have, the gift that he has prepared for them. If you don't tell them, they might not ever know. And Satan might win that battle. Tell them, because you have to accept. You have to believe in your heart. You've got to. Confess it with your mouth. That he is Lord. All right, like Brittany mentioned, and I think we mentioned up here, we've got a chili cook-off today. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. We've got a lot of interesting chilies to taste. Um, so that should be really fun. I don't know how hot they are. I know ours isn't very hot. So, but I, I would venture to say that Wes's might light you on fire <laughs> if you look at it or smell it. So <laughs> uh, he makes some of the most awesome seasonings and stuff. Uh, we, we got to see some people try some the other day. It was quite humorous. So if you like hot stuff, enjoy. I'm sure you're going to find it. All right, let's pray. Hmm. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that you made a way where there is no way. Thank you, Jesus, that you chose to be the perfect ultimate sacrifice so that we can come to the Father. Thank you, Lord, that there is no other way, that there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved but by Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the Most High God. Lord, we accept you. We accept the sacrifices that you made. We thank you for the sacrifices that you made. Help us to walk that out in our lives. Help us to reflect you to the world, to those people around us, Lord. Help us to not live in sin and shame anymore. Not live in regret, not live in fear, Lord, but help us to accept what you've done for us. God, we love you. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And we can't wait to continue eternity with you forever. Lord, we pray these things in the name of Jesus, the name above every other name. Amen.